Scarcity for us is always a relationship. It's not a mere fact of nature or a mere moment in time. So it's always a relationship between how we understand nature and how we understand desires or what, what's moving the economy. But there were a number of people, in particular in England, but throughout Europe, um, who really thought of nature as capable of infinite expansion. Right? It could go on exponentially. And, and here we are kind of in, have a, a kind of a double helix of infinities. Right? So infinite desires and infinite nature. At any given moment, the world is still scarce, right? There's not enough to satisfy everyone, but nature continues to move with desires in a direction of, of infinite or indefinite progress. The current planetary emergency is forcing us to confront the unsustainability of cornucopianism and, and having to embrace a different way of being in the world, a different uh, way of thinking about desire and nature. And we call that planetary scarcity. If all we had to do was decarbonize the economy, perhaps there might be some technical solution, but to also at the same time avoid a sixth mass extinction, which means setting aside land, which means possibly retreating or at least trying to repair what we damaged, um, it's a monumental challenge. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast, the bi-weekly meeting where we have in-depth discussions with researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our societies, or in other terms, their resource use and pollution emissions, and how to reduce their environmental impact in a systemic, socially just, and context-specific way. I'm your host, Aristide from Metabolism of Cities, and today we're going to go in-depth in a topic that we hear more and more. The topic is scarcity. We live in a period of polycrisis where carbon emissions and inequalities are abundant, whereas future natural and material resources are scarce. Yet it is not the first time uh, our societies are, uh, are facing serious environmental and injustices challenges. And the notion of, no, uh, of scarcity has always been central to debates between word views or two opposing camps. Um, we're going to name them here two opposing camps, which are corn cornucopians and finitarians. To better understand how our current understanding of the relationship between the economy and nature has been forged over the centuries, um, we should start looking at the past to guide us through this historical understanding and odyssey of a scarcity and this relationship between economy and nature, I have the pleasure to invite Frederick uh, Arbiton Johnson, uh, who is Associate Professor uh, of British History at the University of Chicago, and Carl Benefield, uh, who is a Professor of um, History at Barnard College. Together, they recently uh, published their book called Scarcity, a history from the origins of capitalism uh, to the climate crisis. With all that being said, welcome, Frederick. Welcome, Carl. Uh, thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks so much, Aristide. Thank, Thank you. Great. Fantastic. Um, perhaps the easiest way to, to move uh, uh, is to just ask you, how did you become interested first in history? Because this is just a vast field. And more specifically, um, on well how did you get from history to uh to the this notion of scarcity but perhaps frederick let's start with you you are interested if i'm not mistaken in british history what what is so interesting in british history uh well carl and i are both british historians i should i should begin by saying um british history um in especially in the period between 1600 and, and 1900 uh, uh, marks several of the great thresholds um, in not just European history, but global history, including, of course, a topic that Coral is a specialist in, the financial revolution of the late 17th and early 18th centuries, uh, as well as uh, the Scottish Enlightenment um, with Adam Smith and his colleagues, 
and of course also the beginnings of socialism um, uh, Robert Owen for example um, and uh, industrialization uh, and then of course um, towards the middle of the 19th century um, the hege the hege hegemony of uh, the British Empire um, um, free trade imperialism Pax Britannica so you you cover a lot of ground when you, when you <laughs> work in in British history yeah 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 I wouldn't have thought that actually it covers all of the challenges of uh, between colonialism and resource use and uh, the the notion of progress but then Carl you're also interested if I understand correctly in intellectual and political history how mm -hmm. ideologies are made if I'm not uh, yeah. Uh, mistaken yeah so I I came out of economics um, and the reason why I was drawn into economics is because I was interested in questions of poverty inequality and power and and I found fairly quickly as that I was quite frustrated with the way that economists um, speak about these terms uh, and uh, you know, I spent my my graduate school days um, trying to understand how economics, neoclassical economics, emerged as an ideology, as a way of thinking about the world, as a way of approaching the world, where some questions are allowed to be asked, uh, but other questions are are kind of muted or silenced by by the paradigm. Um, and even back then, I felt like one of the assumptions. Um, that economists make that really shapes their worldview is this notion of perennial scarcity. And, you know, a scarcity that really has nothing to do with riches or poverty, it has nothing to do with whether there are enough environmental resources or not. It's just a blanket statement, a bl blanket assumption that's grounded in the idea of humans having insatiable desires for more and more consumption. And that commodities are fungible. One commodity can almost magically be transformed to another through uh, the market. Um, and if you have insatiable desires and the world is fungible, then we want more of everything all the time. And maybe that's a, an, an accurate description of, of how humans function within capitalism. But back then, I was interested in, you know, the problems of applying that way of thinking to history when that was not the prevailing kind of modus operandi of most people. And also to apply it to less developed areas of the world where that is not something that's been internalized. So, so, so that's really where the... The, the interest in economic as an ideological construct comes from for, for, for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, th that's fascinating indeed. And yeah, I was very, of course, pleased to read the book because indeed scarcity is, well, is a worldview uh, that is used by different people. We're going to get to that. But um, how did you collaborate? What was the decision that you said, okay, let's make this book? Why? Was this missing or did you say this is just an opportunity to collaborate? Why this book? Is it just to do the, the yang to Pierre Charbonnet's yin of uh, abundance? <laughs> we should make a scarcity or? But it's uh, so our first book, uh, you know, Freddie's book on, on the Scottish Enlightenment and mine on, on the English financial revolutions. Both of them are bringing together a history of political economy with the history of science. Um, so in these books, we're making more local interventions in the way that people think about, you know, science and economy, nature and economy. Um, and we were both uh, sort of um, uh, speculating as to what our next project would be. Uh, I had the idea of writing a book on a, a more popular book on the history of scarcity. And Frederick had the idea of writing a more popular book on the history of abundance and cornucopianism. And, you know, we're, we're both Swedes, um, both working on British British history. Uh, we spend time in Sweden uh, on occasion. And, and on one of these walks, uh, we're sitting there looking out of this beautiful uh, part of Stockholm. And we realize we're writing the same book, just a <laughs> slightly different point of view. And it was just this kind of fortuitous circumstance where our skill set really complemented each other uh, perfectly. Um, so 
where I have some weaknesses, you know, Frederick has 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 real expertise and strength, and and vice versa. So um, it really fit nicely as a as a as an intellectual puzzle. Um, and um, and then we started. You know, sketching ideas and and things came together extremely smoothly, and we felt like, you know, there's more and more of a reason to give a kind of long durée analysis of different worldviews and different ways of thinking about scarcity, uh, and it felt to us that it was more and more uh, pertinent to to historicize something in order to break through the way that neoclassical scarcity has become normalized and legitimized. Um, it's funny because indeed, I mean, we will go through um, this uh, two headed approach, which is the, well, the affluence or the abundance approach and then the finitarian approach. And you have different subcategories in each of them and some actually intermingle or are composite. But um, within the book, you also have more tales of context uh, about how life was in some parts of the world and how these worldviews arrived in, and felt very much when you mentioned long durée I, I, I could uh, very much imagine uh, like Brodel or someone like this explaining what the life was in the 16th century in England or something like that so I felt that you well not only you you spend time into writing about ideas but also about well for me it felt like reading uh, reading about the life back in different contexts somehow um was that a uh, something important for you or was that kind of out of a you know a, an accident or or, or mm -hmm. yeah not at all uh since i started training um as an historian, I've been inspired by by the Annals School, by Braudel and and other great uh, historians of the recent past, always to think um, about ideas and intellectual developments in their material context, in their social and political context. Uh, it's it's not easy, um, but I think the payoff is great. Um, and I should say, you know, without um, uh, without being needlessly antagonistic, I think there are schools of intellectual history uh, that are much more narrowly focused on minute developments uh, in, you know, in influence, intellectual influence, uh, the exchanges between different thinkers. Uh, we don't, we don't, of course, we, we've learned an enormous amount from that more narrowly situated intellectual history. In fact, we could never have written this book without it. Um, but I think Carl and I both uh, are completely agreed that um, in order to understand and, as Carl was saying, denaturalize uh, the neoclassical idea of scarcity, we have to um, we have to situate um, that idea in its context. It's a very absurd and strange idea. Um, too often, it's left. Uh, left as a self-evident reality. And the same goes for growth itself. Mm. We, we live in a world made of growth, or at least within capitalism, we live in a world of growth. But of course, if you, if you step into other cultures or into the past, that is not so. Um, um, but it seems, I, I think Coral will agree with me that mm. um, whatever cornucopianism is, it's not simply... Uh, a kind of figment of the imagination of a few uh, individual thinkers. Um, it's also a great material and social movement. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes the thinkers are running ahead of the material movement and they're, they're visionaries. And we'll talk about that in a moment, right? Yeah. They're anticipating a future that's not really, that's still speculative. But mm -hmm. then comes a moment later on when thinkers and material uh, processes are more in sync and we get a hegemonic worldview born out of that moment. Yeah, this is a fascinating, the fact of, uh, well, apologies for me, it's new, but perhaps for you it's evident, but the fact of how scholars and I, well, ideologies are either preceding, uh, reinforcing, or, or even locking us into these material and economic uh, well, realities, as you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, I, I can just 
add to 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 what what Frederick just said. Um, what what we're trying to, we're trying to think in, in this book um, pretty broadly what the context is. So you know we think about the kind of environmental context of of these of these various ideologies, but also the social and the political context um, that all has 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 a role to play. Um, you know, we fundamentally also as intellectual historians believe that ideas really matter and that ideas shape how we understand the world. Um, you know, when you walk around, you interact, you travel, you you live in the world, you, you're, you're, you can't abstract from that lived experience. So you need ideas to kind of make sense of it all. Um, and those ideas become very powerful in the way that we shape our behavior, shape the way we interact with others, how we talk about this reality with others. And if we continue down that that line of of, of how ideas shape us, you know, it also cha- shapes how we vote. It shapes uh, what kind of loss we passed. Uh, it shapes how we educate our children. Uh, so the worldview is shaped by these ideas. And, you know, after a certain point, these worldviews become really kind of self-fulfilling prophecies. They they, they start to shape the, world, the way the world actually uh, looks. Uh, so we create worlds, you know, for, on the basis of our ideas. Now, there's and and in in our book we we try to make this clear there's never just one dominant worldview or one dominant ideology um you know ideologies come and go but they they never quite disappear they're kind of you know as frederick likes to put it uh, they're kind of nestled in the social frame the social fabric of society right um so th- there there's um th- but there's a a, a a sense here in in our work that we really believe that these ideas are powerful and therefore necessary to be to be to be be well understood in order and in particular uh, now that we seem to be in need of you know a new way of thinking about the economy nature nexus yeah yeah um before we before we continue on this because i think it's important to to kind of see also how th- well, these two camps uh, actually always, always. That's a that's a question I would like to ask you: whether they always existed, coexisted, or were actually always uh, clashing. But um, how, how, or when did the term or the notion of scarcity emerged? Um, because I can imagine in since the Neolithic, you know. It was difficult. It was tough to actually live. We we needed a lot of labor to to just satisfy primal needs, and so mm. scarcity might have been always there. But when did it enter the mindset and the worldview that th- this is a notion somehow that we mobilize and we talk about, I- even if it wasn't the term scarcity, right? To to answer that question, it's important to keep in mind uh, the way that we've structured this book. That this is that scarcity for us is always a relationship. It's not a mere fact of nature or a mere uh, uh, um, moment in time. So it's always a relationship between how we understand nature and how we understand desires or what what's moving the economy, right? What's the impetus? So if we go back to Marshall Solins and Stone Age economics, he talks about, um, you, you know, you know affluence and prosperity in a world that is very limited but because desires are limited you you know the sense of scarcity is is not overwhelming is not present um so uh also in the it, where we begin the story in the 16th century we use this concept called near aristotelian scarcity which is also kind of in some ways trying to capture you know a much longer you know, agrarian um, Christian worldview. Um, here we talk about a nature that you know doesn't change much over time, and it's not liable or um, amenable to to much technological improvement or 
you know, it's not flexible. It's not pliable. It's not malleable. You can't all of a sudden just start making more of it. It, you know, produces, um, you know, a, a fixed amount. And that amount is in some ways also dictated by, you know, spiritual forces and, and perceived to be uh, dictated by, by the deity. Um, so in order for that to, for, in order for human societies to create a balance with that notion of nature, it was extremely important to curtail and limit people's desires. And that was done through sumptuary laws, but it was most importantly done through religion. Um, the condemnation of, for example, of the seven deadly sins. A lot of those are about, you know, making sure that we don't want too much, that we don't covet too much, and that we're not uh, envious of others who have more. Uh, and was also an idea of, you know, of, of a geometric equality where everyone had what was needed for them to fulfill their role in society. So obviously it was not, you know, everyone didn't have the same because kings and nobility and priests needed more than the peasants, but everyone had just enough for, and 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 the, the right moderation of what was needed. So in that world, um, you know, nature is fixed, but so are desires. So it's a balance of limitations. So that's a particular type of scarcity condition. And and so what broke this cycle into, well, entering, when did uh, abundance then enter the game and yeah. then made this bicephal, uh, schizophrenic uh, understanding of our society? <laughs> uh, of course, it's possible to find um, moments of conspicuous consumption, especially in courtly settings in in elite um, from from the beginning of the first state, the first agrarian societies. Um, but if you're looking for a broader movement, um, uh, if you like consumer society rather than courtly consumption, then it's pretty clear that the 17th century is a major threshold. Um, and so if you're looking at the material forces, you know, long distance trade, the discovery of the new world, uh, rival empires, interconnections between Asia, between Asian luxury consumption and European luxury consumption. So, uh, so in some ways, the, the doors are opening. If you were just looking at the material side of things, mm. there are doors opening in the 17th century. Um, uh, and again, that's not to deny that there's an earlier history to to excess and abundance, but it never on such a large scale and never in a global setting is our argument. Yeah, uh, just uh, just one one very important um, um, caveat with the story we're telling here. Um, our categories are not for the most part, they're not actors categories. Um, mm -hmm. They are constructs that we're imposing on the path. Mm. So when we when we talk about intellectual movement, uh, we are, um, if you like, um, we are suggesting names and unities that um, uh, would be recognizable to people in the past. They if 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 you told people in in uh, the 1690s. Uh, there's a new movement of foot and we and we think this is a cornucopian moment mm. they might actually agree with us um <laughs> but but the point is that we are imposing for the sake of clarity analytical clarity we are imposing yeah. a set of constructs yeah. okay so let, let, let me just add to what what Freddie said there so so the, what that kind of moment in which the consumption goods are just exploding and not just the elites have access to it but also a little bit lower in the in the in, amongst the middling source that was captured by people like barbin and mandeville who basically said that it's these infinite desires it, it, you know that they're, they're unavoidable and they're actually good for society because they're driving the economy right and then the other aspect of this you know, so empire, as Frederick was saying, and international trade, hugely important, but also, um, you know, magic, um, alchemy. Uh, and we talk a lot in the book about this new movement in the 17th century of using alchemy as a worldview 
uh, amongst, um, you know, scientists or proto-scientists um, who saw and understood nature differently. All of a sudden, nature became this kind of uh, treasure trove or treasure, treasure chest that God had given to humanity, and all humanity needed to do was to decipher the source code of the universe. And the way to do that was through experimental and empirical science. Um, we know that as, you know, uh, uh, or we associate that with, with Francis Bacon and his, you know, vision for scientific project, uh, for pr progress, sorry. But there were a number of people in particular in England, but throughout Europe, um, who really thought of nature as capable of infinite expansion. Right? It could go on exponentially. And and here we are kind of in have a, a kind of a double helix of infinities. Right? So infinite desires and infinite nature. At any given moment, the world is still scarce, right? There's not enough to satisfy everyone, but nature continues to move with desires in a direction of, of infinite or indefinite progress. So that really is you know, a huge watershed This this and, and opens up the possibility of cornucopian thinking. And, you know, as, as Fredericus pointed out in, in, um, elsewhere as well, you know, th this is a, 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 a really transformative moment in world history in which what would have been perceived as a fairly absurd idea of infinite growth and infinite desires and infinite nature all of a sudden, you know, and it doesn't become dominant right away. There's a there's an immediate backlash, uh, but the ideas are there and they will be picked up later on. Uh, and, you know, they, of course, given a different shape, but that's the kind of origins of this kind of cornucopian worldview. Uh, just one one um, addition uh uh, the the word cornucopia um, enters into English uh, in in the late 16th century, early 17th century. Um, it's in the new trans in, in the translation of the Bible, King James's Bible. It's also in a memorandum written by Francis Bacon to King James about the colonization of Ireland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it shows up again in the writings of these Baconian scientists and alchemists that Carl was talking about. Yeah. Uh, one of them publishes a work called Cornucopia. Yeah. So, so corn, we used, again, our categories, uh, not an actor's category strictly. It brings together yeah. two different sets of ideas about nature and desire, but it would have been recognizable to the people in in the 17th century yeah yeah that's fantastic i uh, i love this because i remember for instance <clears throat> well of course we use the the term of metabolism and marxist metabolism as well and just the, the term metabolism was just 20 years before marx uses it so the fact that new terms exist are also the zeitgeist of the the era uh, and kind of embody uh, the you know a number of notions that were ripe to to be understood by people and to to be mobilized yeah. for uh, political endeavors scientific endeavors etc cetera, etc cetera. um yeah i i when reading about bacon and it, it's quite fascinating because a number of today's capitalism can be seen in his writings so in terms of how science and progress are going to make us um, well come out of a, a misery or ingenuity or yeah. the fact that nature is feminine and uh, you know technicality is more masculine and we need to to dominate somehow uh, nature um, but at the very same time or well not at the very same time but beforehand there was also Thomas More with Utopia as well which brought a completely 180 degree different story and both had when you mentioned the the opening of uh, of trade um it also kind of underlines the importance of mer merchants and how they were seen in this yeah. entire um story and how even well um religion was mm -hmm. kind of uh, th there was this dichotomy with luther and merchants as well so we, we also see how some new 
reconfiguration of society kind of very splits into two camps and these two camps grow very strongly and i don't know do do they vocally um offend each other or do they coexist in in isolation how does that work uh, in the past uh, you uh i'll i'll start uh Well, I mean, that's a that's a very very good question uh, and a, and a fascinating question. You know, there's always been since Aristotle this this kind of uneasy relationship um, to to money and money making. Um, you know, money is supposed to be a mediator of exchange of use value, um, but if someone starts to use money for accumulation purposes, it it upset the kind of careful, carefully calibrated um, power balance in society. So there's so when merchants are becoming more and more prominent, uh, there's a real fear that they are going to upset the harmony of the body politic, right? And they're by many seen as a kind of cancerous growth who mm -hmm. pursues infinite gain for gain's sake. And that that is really uh, undermining um, you know, justice and morality in society. Um, so Thomas More, for example, thinks of the merchants as being the driving force behind the enclosures in England, whereby the land was turned from a common property into one in which you grazed sheep in order to produce wool for Flanders or uh, Northern Italy, because, because the, the British produce a high, high quality wool. But the, how that how those enclosures then led to the eviction of the general population, you know, their birthright of access to land was eliminated, creating massive amount of poverty and massive amount of suffering and instability. So, um, you know, more and others were saying that this this is, in fact, a new condition of scarcity, whereby some people always want more because they're engaged in infinite accumulation. Whereas others, the poor, always want more because they don't have anything at all. So they're locked in this kind of constant uh, desire for more and more um, for very different reasons. So, um, you know, and there's a long, so we call that enclosure scarcity. There's a long tradition of that kind of thinking that goes up to to our to our period. Um, um uh, so that 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 is that never really goes away um there's a very interesting relationship to how these new baconians how they understood that kind of scarcity vis-a-vis -vis the one that they were talking about and for them they were proponents of private property and enclosures but they thought that by scientifically organizing the production Uh, and making use of new science in agriculture, that they could expand the amount of goods and necessities and luxuries coming from the land um, on such a scale that you know everyone would be well fed. Um, um, the, the issues of poverty that that so heavily weighed on England in the 17th century would be lifted. Um, and, and here, you know, we should also add a kind of, you know, they're also millenarians, so they're deeply Protestant, right? So they believed that there was a kingdom of heaven on earth that was would last for a thousand years, in which abundance was possible, not even possible, it, it would it would materialize. So, um, Uh, you know, that, and that's a very different idea of, of Protestantism from the one we're accustomed to hearing from Weber, for example. Mm. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe I could add one more thing to that, which is um, if you're looking at Francis Bacon himself, uh, Coral is absolutely right. He is aware of this commercialization. He's aware of the enclosures. And he writes one of his most interesting books, seldom read is the history of the reign of King Henry uh, VII, which is a kind of a very early precocious description of the commercialization of England um, and the role of the state in that. Um, but it's important to see that Bacon himself was not a merchant um, and that 
some of his inspiration comes from very different. There's no, what I'm saying is he's not simply some kind of um, mechanical reflection of a new mercantile mentality. He takes inspiration from natural philosophy, from alchemy. And in some sense, his imagination is theological. Um, what I mean by that is when he thinks about human power and the possibility of mastering nature, he is actually drawing on the theological imagination. He asks, um, how, how is it that um, humans could rekindle, uh, how could humans rekindle the powers they had as their birthright uh, with Adam in Eden, in the Garden of Eden? How can we uh, reconquer the tree of knowledge and the tree of life? Um, so it's really a kind of breathtakingly, again, it's a religiously inspired project of breathtaking ambition um, to imitate God, to acquire, uh, acquire um, the, the divine knowledge of nature, what he calls uh, the science of light. Can I just add one more thing to that? You you mentioned the the kind of gendered aspect as well uh, of Francis Bacon has been seen very much as someone who wants to develop knowledge, uh, and knowledge is power, and power leads to conquest. And it was very much the the conquest of Mother Nature, uh, and it was very much perceived as a kind of in 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 Bacon's terms of of a violent process. Um, and um, Carolyn Merchant and others have pointed out uh, the, 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 that the discourse here is a very patriarchic, uh, violent discourse. What, what needs to be added to that as a nuance, I mean, and, and that's certainly a correct interpretation. There's a, certainly, that gave rise to a mechanical worldview as well where nature will be subdued by machines and, you know, force. Uh, but amongst the Hart Libyans, these, um, you, know, you know, the disciples of, 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 of Bacon, uh, who very much thought within the alchemical framework, alchemy was very much um, about trying to find nature's own attraction. Uh, trying to find different materials and energies that are attracted to each other. And the, the, the uh, iconography and metaphors used in their discussion was always one of, of kind of masculine and feminine energies um, combining, giving birth to new materials, new powers. So it was a much more, much smoother and much, much less violent imagery of humans operating on nature, not not contorting it, but really uh, uh, accelerating nature's own processes and making uh, those sort of natural teleologies. Uh, come alive faster and thereby benefiting humanity, you know, uh, more urgently than they otherwise would have. It's, um, it's incredible how we can translate these challenges with today, such as how people were, uh, uh, well, were scared of merchants today, that this might be finance, what you yeah. just mentioned about you know, the theological elements of nature with eugenics or whatever. So there is always this same kind of reappropriation or recontextualization of the same elements. Uh, but before we dive into this, perhaps we can um, just more clearly uh, redefine these two categories and their subcategories because I think they hold a lot of uh, richness to them. Perhaps we can start with... Um, the Fintarian one, and then so you have six subcategories the neo Aristotelian, the utopian, Malthusian, romantic, socialist, and planetary. So they all come with we have some desires that we need to keep at bay and we live within something of scarcity. What is the real difference as we go through the ages? I mean, of course, there's a, a historical uh, difference, but what is what is what are some other differences in these six uh, subcategories? 
Yeah, so uh, very important again to to notice that these categories are all our categories. We we have named them um, and constructed them to to make um, make the past a little more easily uh, e- easy to grasp. Um, so cornucopian, if I can just uh, uh, contrast it with finitarian, cornucopian then is um, the word for a worldview or a, a whole family of worldviews oriented towards infinite desire and the mastery of nature. Finitarian is, um, on the one hand, the worldview that precedes cornucopianism, the 16th century neo-Aristotelian worldview that Carl described earlier. So uh, a kind of orderly, static universe uh, dominated by the idea of a great chain of being um, with a Christian prescriptive uh, morality of curbing desire. In the 17th century, these early cornucopians, defenders of infinite desire and the mastery of nature, basically explode the idea of the finite universe and finite desires and endorse a more dynamic worldview. But um, they don't, they're not, they're still a minority. They're not a dominant current in society. And it won't be until the 19th century and the, uh, the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century that uh, cornucopian worldviews become really dominant. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that, but that's very important uh, uh, to understand the kind of the larger flow. Finitarian worldviews are opposing oppositional worldviews after the 17th century. They're never never dominant again Mm. after neo-Aristotelianism. They're always uh, the worldview of the heretic, of the utopian, of the dissident, of the socialist. Um, Yeah, Uh, so so now we are, to, to, to kind of complete the arc, we end the book with a suggestion that the current planetary emergency is forcing us to confront the unsustainability of cornucopianism um, and, and, and having to embrace a different way of being in the world, a different a way of thinking about desire and nature. And we call that planetary scarcity. Yeah. But maybe just add one thing to that and, and, and maybe stop me if I'm if I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, but w- one aspect in these um, in e- these fen- finitarian perspectives is there's a, a, a sense in, in a number of them that with time, um, humanity can actually transform itself to the point where their passions and pleasures and what they strive for changes. Um, So amongst the Enlightenment philosophers, for example, in particular David Hume, there's a sense that as, you know, um, societies improve and advance, that our minds will also become more refined and more sophisticated, and we will therefore become less interested in mere consumption that will develop to the point where we take more pleasure in uh, a, a, a poem or a conversation or a, you know a reading than consuming a new suit and that therefore that will kind of easen or soften these infinite desires that Mandeville talked about and with economic growth that there's a possibility that there is material, prosperity so that the absolute needs will have been met so that yes there will still be a kind of scarcity tension between infinite desires and infinite nature but it would be it it, it will be um marginalized a bit it won't be as 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 felt as intensely um and and similar ways um you know uh even if we talk about someone like Keynes, who predicted that that scarcity would be a thing of the past by the time we get to 2030, so we have seven more years, uh, he used the term that um, you know John Stuart Mill and others used as well. Uh, they talked about the art of living, 
uh, where we develop as a society different type of passions, different types of interests that are not about consumption, um, that are not about resource use, uh, intensive resource use. It's it's about forging a different culture of sorts. Um, and that if that becomes the preoccupation of people, then we're no longer, um, you know, operating like homo economicus, constantly wanting more, constantly wanting the new fashion, constantly thinking of ourselves first and foremost as consumers. Um, yes, of course, we would consume, we would use natural resources, but it wouldn't be the primary kind of, um, our primary motivation. I, I think you could contrast that version of finitarianism. It, that's like a high end or high equilibrium um, finitarianism with a different, the romantic idea of scarcity, which is really uh, about uh, idealizing agrarian society and idealizing nature. And so it, rather than moving through commercial society to a kind of release or a sublimation of desire, we stay put at an earlier stage of development and we embrace the simplicity of desire, the finite uh, forms of desire in that particular stage. Um, and, and we find meaning not in human consumption of material goods, but in the experience of nature, in the experience of beauty. So you see how that's a, so 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 you can begin to see how within the family tree of finitarian scarcities, there's quite a bit of space and 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 room for different variations. And that you know that's something we see all the way back to Thomas More's Utopia. Um, there's there's a romanticist element there, and there's you know he says at one point, for example, in Utopia. No one desires more and more gold because why would you want? Why would you covet gold and silver when you get the sun and the moon that are infinitely more beautiful than gold and silver? Yeah, it's 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 so funny to see how, indeed, you mentioned dissident and romantic as well, kind of the finitarian approach, whereas the other ones, uh, cornucopian, might be more optimistic and future driven. So I think there's also a notion of do do they live in the present or in the future and also where where do they draw um well richness from what, what is the source of uh of uh feeling accomplished somehow and uh and these are very different i mean if we look at uh, enlightened scarcity as you mentioned it with uh the, the romantic one the capitalist versus the socialist they're they're really looking at at value very differently right we should probably talk about socialism shouldn't we um, yes that's a particularly interesting um variation on these themes and we argue that in some ways socialism um, is a hybrid between the finitarian and cornucopian mm. um uh, one very important thing to recognize with socialism is that when it emerges with uh, people like robert owen in the early 19th century, um, it really draws strength from the technological developments around. Uh, Owen quite sincerely believes that uh, universal abundance and affluence is now possible, uh, that that um, uh, not just uh, machinery in the manufacturing sector, but also food production will be revolutionized so that we will live from now on, if we can just figure out an equitable social arrangement, we will live in a post-scarcity world where everyone's desires will be fulfilled. Um, so that's the that's the early, uh, if you like, the utopian stage of socialism. Um, now let Carl describe what happens next. Well, I mean, it's, so there's also Fourier, right, who who talks about uh, people's pleasure profile. Uh, and that there's certainly one out of 12 of those has to do with the consumption of goods, mm -hmm. right? But then there are all these other pleasures, right? Um, and very complicated psychological mechanisms that give us, uh, that, that promotes well-being. And we should organize society in a way that takes the entire pr pleasure profile into account, not just 
than one that's about consumption and accumulation. So, you know, in Fourier's mind, it's a it's a real reaction to uh, what had become in the 19th century kind of middle class values and middle class uh, ideas of success. Um, so, um, uh, and 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 you know, once we get to Marx, Marx, at least, I mean, there are a hundred ways of thinking about Marx, of course, but the way that we characterize Marx um, is um, thinking about the driving force behind capitalism, not being the general population's desire for more and more consumption, not even the capitalist class desire for more and more consumption, but rather that it's the capitalist class quest never ending quest for more and more power and power comes in the form of reproduction of class relations so um in marx's worldview scarcity is very much about power about the capitalist tri class trying to impose work which is the primary form of imposition of power and social control and the workers trying to find ways to protect time and energy for their own projects, not necessarily consumption, but just freedom and praxis. Um, so, um, so that that the kind of the the, the clash here that's creating a, a, the the feeling of scarcity is very much grounded in in power, and it's a destructive form of power uh, that in a future society, you know, needs to be lifted, needs to be transcended. That dialectic needs needs to be ruptured. And this, I mean, socialism has suffered this in the 20th century, even today, that yeah. doesn't find its its footholding anymore because before it was just a notion of equality, but not true scarcity necessarily. It was more productivity and we need to, to actually put everyone to work and everybody will have enough. But the idea was not to limit the, the desires necessarily. It was that everybody has the same share and today's socialism is struggling to find a place in this planetary scarcity where yeah. it, we need to redistribute, but we need to redistribute yeah. within planetary scarcity. And I think this yeah. um, incremental or iterative redefinition is is very uh, interesting for, for both currents, right? I mean, well, one of the aspects here that we, that, that we don't actually talk much about in the book, but You know, the Cold War plays a really important role, uh, both in the West, uh, obviously, and, and in terms of shaping the scarcity notion in the West and shaping the scarcity notion in, in the East. And, you know, the idea of economic growth is, is not just about consumption. It's also about the state and it's about military development and it's about geopolitics. And again, if you come back to Marx's point of view, if, if the If, if the governing dynamic is a power battle, power is always relative. So that means that it's an it, it's 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 infinite. It can continue forever, that dynamic. Um, so I think what happens in in Eastern Europe is that uh, there's an idea of of an infinite nature and the application of technology to nature to produce as much as possible. But there's also a kind of infinite desire not necessarily for consumption, but for aggrandizement and power. And so um, that is another kind of cornucopian idea. Um, it, it's it's not what Marx and Fourier and Owen envisioned, a world in which the desires wouldn't necessarily be curtailed, but reorganized and redirected. We, uh, we have followed the debate about Uh, Marx's ecology closely um, while, while thinking about uh, socialist scarcity. And I think we land on the side of the skeptics. Um, there are great, great arguments by John Bellamy Foster and others about the, the nascent ecological thinking in Marx. But on the whole, um, we tend to side with the people who see in Marx Uh, fundamentally a critique of social relations, uh, as Carl has been saying, but not all that much thought about ecology. Um, it's entirely possible Marx, Marxian theory could be amended 
um, with ecological uh, perspectives. We don't deny that. Um, but Marx himself, it seems to us, is in some sense quite happy with the idea of the mastery of nature. And, uh, you know, uh, even his borrowings from soil chemistry, Liebig and others, uh, imagine the soil as a kind of factory that can be scientifically managed. Uh, so, so that explains perhaps um, a little bit the cornucopian uh, current, the strong cornucopian and Promethean current in 20th century socialism. For, for this, I love uh, history, I have to admit, because um, I spoke with Jason Moore, for instance, on the podcast as well, uh, the recent book of uh, Kohei Saito as well. And I asked to, to Jason, like, how does a historian function, right? I mean, because how do you propose a theory? Because it's a recollection of past ingredients that you realign and then propose something, right? And he said, well, you propose and You just wait for counter arguments. There's nothing, I mean, you know, that that's the, the validity or not of a certain theory. Is you, you, of course, need to, to assemble uh, or have a constellation of facts and then propose a certain theory and then it gets dismissed or approved or something like that. And this, I would love to hear you in the same room as him and others and, and see what, what this discussion would feel like. We should turn now. We should turn now to to the the sort of the end of the book and this great battle that we see between neoclassical scarcity and planetary <laughs> scarcity. That's really where we end yeah. up. Um, so that's what we should talk about next. But maybe we should emphasize from the beginning that we don't just like uh, Jason. We're still waiting for the answer. We're not yeah. offering a recipe for a socialist world revolution or or a neoliberal technical fix. Yeah. Uh, we are just clearing a space uh, for new thought and new action by looking to the past. The, the, the one thing just to, to add to that, um, you, you know, ideas are, um, you know, it, 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 ideas are powerful weapons. They're powerful um tools um you know it, it, in some ways it, it it's it, it's partly about whether ideas are or, or theories are true or not um but, but that's a very tenuous ter territory to enter into um so when we think about you know ideas about the economy nature nature nexus um Uh, you know, the way we think about these um, has a kind of strategic importance. It's not just an ideological importance that that kind of like the Aula Minerva sets flight at dusk to survey the battlefield and tells us what it looks like and shapes the understanding of it. Uh, it certainly theory does that, but theory also shapes how we enter the future and how we guide ourselves into that future what institutions we emphasize um what rules and laws that we that we implement and and that's why it's so important that we develop new ideas and i think jason Morris is, is one of the foremost um most dynamic thinkers in in trying to push us in in a different direction theoretically intellectually and ideologically uh, and i think what we are hoping to do with this book is Uh, to provide a kind of smurgos board of different approaches that can then be used by, you know, social th theorists and, and others as they approach the future. And, you know, the problems that, that you know, that we're going to now pivot to, I mean, these are, these are you know, the, the, um, this is not just about ideology. This is much more serious. <laughs> right? This is this is this is why we wrote this book, because we, you know, the way that we understand and what we hear from climate scientists is that this is not just about liking capitalism or not liking capitalism or liking technology or not liking technology. Th these are, um, you know, this is a serious moment in history. And I think we need the past to inform our future thinking about this. Frederick, you wanted to discuss the, um, 
well, neoclassical versus um, planetary scarcity, perhaps that would be a good moment, no? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll let Coral, Coral will help me with the intellectual side of this, but I'll just uh, uh, turn to the material for a moment, because I think that really explains what's happening. So on the one hand, the Industrial Revolution and, and um, European imperialism reached um, new, new uh, heights in the 19th century. Um, uh, and of course, fossil fuel, cheap energy from coal into steam powered production and steam shipping, uh, really uh, unshackled capitalism and turned it into a global force, a world changing force. And it's not a coincidence. This is exactly the moment where we leave behind the natural variability of the Holocene and we move into a new climate, uh, which, of course, uh, uh, you could call that the Anthropocene, or you could call it the Capitalocene, doesn't really matter to us. But uh, we, 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 are, we have entered into a moment of anthropogenic climate change because of this world-changing uh, uh, um, transformation of capitalism and, and empire in the 19th century. So that's really underpinning the intellectual changes that we'll talk about uh, next. Uh, first of all, the rise of the rise of marginalist economics and neoclassical economics, and then planetary scarcity. Carl, do you want to walk us through the intellectual side of that? Yeah, I mean, the, so so what we talk about in the book is that there's a kind of a weird moment when marginalism and neoclassical economics emerges. Right, this is a moment as Frederick was uh, describing when, for the first time, we actually have a cornucopia of, of commodities and we're able to tame or subjugate nature and make it produce this extraordinary amount of material wealth. And the Crystal Palace exhibition in 1851 is, we, we use that as a, as a kind of a watershed moment where people are congregating hundreds of thousands of people to Hyde Park to witness this industrial marvel, right? What uh, what this new steam um, engine powered economy, what it can produce. So it's abundance, and it's you know the the world is now integrated in a, in a globalized uh, network through steam shipping. Um, it, it's really an extraordinary moment of abundance and 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 economic growth. And the economists at this point decide to focus on the marginal choice, right? the infinitesimal choice, um, choices on the margin, uh, narrowing it down really on each firm and each consumer, what they want at the particular juncture. Um, so it does away with the global picture right? and just focuses on, on the nitty, nitty uh, gritty of, of, of um, firms and consumers. Um, the other aspect here is that the world in the 19th century is, of course, also becoming much more politicized. So there are all these working class movements, socialist movements, communist movements. Um, and the economists, the way they understand the world is to abstract away from all of that. And they can do that by looking only at the minutia of consum consumer and, uh, and, and profit maximizing choices. So... Um, so as we enter into the 20th century, we have this very peculiar emphasis on the marginal, the small change, right? And scarcity when the world is changing on a scale and rapidity that the world had never seen before, right? So that is shaping a particular worldview that abstracts away from certain things and highlights other things. And the key here was really to make the most out of resources as possible to promote as much consumer welfare as possible. That's the fundamental logic of neoclassical economics. Also embedded in that, even though the neoclassical framework is a static framework, it's not dynamic, but the idea amongst Marshall and others was that you string together optimizing decisions by firms and consumers 
that are also generating the greatest amount of economic growth. Right? Later on in the 50s and 60s, neoclassical economics adds a growth theory to this. But even before we argue that maximum resource use and maximum economic growth are the kind of mantras that come out of neoclassical economics. And one one other one other, one other dimension of this that's worth emphasizing is that um, all of this happens. This move to the infinitesimal it's it, it's probably driven at least in part by a, an eagerness to to make economics more mathematical. We yeah. should say. Uh, but even in the examples in in uh, these economic texts, you see the world of the Crystal Palace exhibition. You see discussion of tea, right, a Chinese commodity. Uh, you and you see an awareness of empire and and long distance trade. So it's not that they they're abstracting away from from the world historical process, but they're certainly not uh, they're not unaware of it. They're not denying it. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and this is also the moment when, um, thanks to chemistry and thanks to engineering, to electrification, it becomes possible to think of the world um, as uh, a, 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 of, of European history and world history as a process of substitution, of moving from one frontier to another, from one invention to another. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so we have a sense of acceleration and generalized substitutionism, right? Everything is fungible. Everything can be replaced. Uh, it's very, very. It's a. It's an absurd idea, right? Because uh, uh, agriculture and ecology are still at the root of all of this. The the cash crops and and the raw materials needed all come from the earth, but economists are led deeper and deeper into this uh, highly idealized idea of nature where human human power is taken for granted and ecology the whole problem of ecology is uh, is put aside and j just to add to to that um, a, a quote by Robert Sala one of the foremost growth theorists um, and he said in 1974 and I quote here, the world can, in effect, get along without natural resources. So exhaustion is just an event, not a catastrophe. That, that is, uh, be, uh, Frederick, just before you, you mentioned about economists, and uh, I, I had exactly the same thought of thinking, it's funny how when you mentioned an infinitesimal, well, this probably started in the 17th century or the 18th century in science, um, chemistry was, uh, let's say, the 19th century, some uh, some part in the 18th century as well. And I was trying to to remember when these elements in science appeared, and therefore how they were reused by a newer science, which were economics. How they, well, to either to become more of a official science or to to be more um, in um, in par with their contemporary issues, they went and uh, and brought concepts from elsewhere to legitimize economics and to make it perhaps more dominant as well in in a in a source of uh, discourse. I think that yeah mm -hmm. yeah no that's a, that's a fruit well I think very important uh, um, way to approach the problem is that there is on the one hand there's a, um, an invocation of the new um, energy physics of thermodynamics um, uh, in in marginalist economics, um, what Phil Morawski has written about. Uh, uh, but there's also a divergence, right? Right at the same moment that ecology is emerging, that evolutionary biology is emerging, we have a kind of disembedding of economic thought from the agrarian base. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, evolutionary biology will show up in strange places in 20th century economic thought, like Hayek. Um, that's that's for sure. But but the mainstream of economic thought is it's in some sense parting away from the agrarian base. Uh, whereas if you go earlier, if you go to people like Smith uh, and of course Malthus and Ricardo, um, the agrarian base is 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 very much uh, uh, present 
in how they think about productivity, how they think about the limits, how they think about growth, right? Well, let me let me just add that. So there's a lot of writing on neoclassical economics and the emergence of neoclassical economics. And, you know, people like Walraw, Jevons and Menger that and, and they're very clear about that in their own writings, that they want to turn economics into a science. And the way to do that was to use mathematical um, language uh, and models. And there's a way to kind of gain scientific legitimacy. Uh, we are of the mindset that, you know, we don't we don't dispute that. But there is a clear underlying ideological and strategic interest in their writings as well. And one of the reasons why their paradigm is picked up and popularized is that indeed it is useful as a worldview in shaping society in the interest of certain people in society. So, you know, the ideas of marginalism were actually around from the 1840s, 1850s, but they're only really picking up steam in the 1870s and they become popularized in the 1890s. So it's not that it was the only new ideas around, but it was a set of ideas that were useful at that particular moment to certain people. Um, if we're trying to reconverge, uh, uh, you mentioned at the beginning, Carl, this double helix going on and off with yeah. scarcity and desires. I, uh, when reading the book, I, I kind of feel that history repeats itself somehow, that we kind of have cycles, but perhaps there are helixes, uh, that we kind of are in the same challenges today when when right uh, reading about Moore's utopia in Bacon's new Atlantis, I kind of see the <laughs> the degrowth movement versus the eco-modernist movement uh word per word re resurface somehow um wh when you read and write about these things how what is your <laughs> what, what are your feelings about this do you how do you distance yourself from present when you read these past elements uh do you uh do you feel that there is a logical sequence until the present do you feel that we, we just are going to perpetuate this debate for the next centuries or what are your feelings when you read about these and write about these well I, i'll i'll start and uh, i'll let frederick uh, conclude our our thoughts here um it, it seems to me as though from the you know late 19th century that there's been such overwhelming belief and confidence in the power of science to uh, enable economic growth so that the dominant debates in the 20th century was not about growth or not growth. It was it was all predicated on growth. And then within that cornucopian worldview, they're, of course, radically different and opposing ideas. Um, what we're entering in now is this moment where that cornucopian idea of infinite nature, you know, it'd be great if we could continue to grow because that's a really simple solution to a lot of economic and social problems um, and political problems. But we're now in that kind of phase of planetary scarcity where where growth is simply impossible. And, and it's um, it, 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 we're pushing up against limits that we we can't fix. We we have power over nature, but a very um, uh, a, a, a very limited power. Right? We there's so many unintended consequences of what we do and our interventions that we don't know how to fix. Um, and and I'll I'll, I'll uh, let let Frederick pick up on this. Um, yeah, uh, we end as Carl just suggested, with what we call the condition of planetary scarcity, which is a, is, uh, a material reality of the planet itself that is rel a relatively new discovery. And that makes it particularly uh, unsettling, right? Um, we have been 
uh, emitting carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases for hundreds of years. But it's only now that the science has come together and and um, uh, conclusively shown us how dangerous this is. The question, of course, is what else? Uh, what other dangerous uh, consequences are we introducing into the Earth system now? Clearly, biodiversity loss uh, is, is uh, a clear and present danger uh, and possibly an even more difficult problem to solve than climate change. De if you could, if all we had to do was decarbonize the economy, perhaps there might be some technical solution, but to also at the same time avoid a fixed mass extinction, which means setting aside land, which means possibly retreating or at least trying to repair what we damaged. Um, it's a monumental challenge. Um, now, uh, planetary scarcity is not Malthusian scarcity. Uh, we, 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 we have a whole chapter uh, devoted to Malthusian scarcity, where we discuss uh, this idea of uh, uh, Malthus and others about um, the finite uh, stock of land and resources and the problem of resource constraint. Uh, planetary scarcity is the problem not of stock, but of sink. Uh, of uh, overproducing pollution through overconsumption uh, and straining the capacity of the Earth system to absorb all the waste materials of our economy. Uh, those things that we thought were infinite, the ocean and the atmosphere, are turning out to be all too finite. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the condition of planetary scarcity. Climate scientists and um, and ecologists are now warning us. Uh, about the, the, the present, uh, the overflowing of the sink. Uh, we have yet to produce social theories, political theories, and a new economic that's uh, sophisticated, sophisticated enough and powerful enough to meet the moment. Um, so that's what I mean by uh, looking back to the past to clear a space for new thought and new action. We have to tackle the problem of neoclassical scarcity first to understand where it came from, how it became dominant, understand its flaws before we move ahead to a new kind of economics. Um, and one more point about this. We are uh, basically prag pragmatists and pluralists about the solution. Um, we agree with Dipesh Chakrabarti that although the problem of uh, the Earth system uh, is a unitary one. Climate change affects the entire planet, albeit in, uh, you know, uh, quite unequally, but it's still, the Earth system is singular, right? It's not multiple things. Humanity is always divided against itself. Um, uh, we, and, and, and that's exactly why we're so interested in, in the plurality of the past. Um, Right. Uh, that's why it's worthwhile thinking about all the different versions of scarcity, finitarian, cornucopian, and thinking through their limitations. Um, you know, if we were simply advocating for a socialist world revolution, we could have made the book much shorter. <laughs> it could have been it could have had three chapters. Right. Yeah. Um, but um, we suspect whatever future we're looking at, will be fragmented, will be divided between different regimes, different ideologies. Um, the question is whether all of them might in some ways become or embrace a more finitarian view of the world based on the new science. Yeah. Yeah, well, thanks. This is absolutely great. I think that's, as you mentioned, like the, the next step forward and where we we as scientists need to, well, start thinking about, uh, start, well, standing on the shoulders of scarcity to <laughs> to mm -hmm. develop a new uh, understanding models, but also um, analytical models and all of this. Um, if people want to further um, explore the notions of scarcity, do you have any other books or films or... Uh, novels that you would like to recommend them to to read or to to watch sure sure um i think um 
science fiction is a nice place to turn to think about the future. Um, I'm a, a big fan of Kim Stanley Robinson's novels. Um, he's been thinking uh, ahead of the curve. He's really been extraordinarily prescient in in, in um, imagining the future. Um, and obviously, the uh, one of his most recent books, The Ministry for the Future, is a good place to start, right? Um, which is sort of a, a near near future science fiction fable about how um, um, how the planetary emergency might produce new political and social uh, forms of organization. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it, it's a surprisingly optimistic take in some ways, perhaps overly. I think he, 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 he himself thinks he was overly optimistic when he wrote it. <laughs> Um, but but yeah, science science fiction might be a nice place to start. Um, Carl, do you have uh, recommendations? Uh, yeah, so I, I do. There is one um, uh, movie that's uh, it's a documentary of sorts, a kind of poetic uh, documentary, and it's called "The Hottest August." It came out in twenty nineteen, which is. Kind of, I mean, it's a very New York specific experience of climate change, um, but it, it is one that brings in both kind of, uh, you know, how this is being felt in the environment. Um, there's a lot of discussion of, of the aftermath of Sandy Hook, for example, but it also really talks about the way that society is organized and, you know, it, it handles both the sort of desire part and the environmental part. And then the other, there was a book that just recently came out that uh, fits quite nicely with, with ours. Uh, it's by Gregory Clays, uh, and it's called Utopianism for a Dying Planet. Uh, we'll... And, and we, yeah. we, we, uh, we also, of course, want to uh, mention, you mentioned Pierre Charbonnier in the beginning, uh, our good friend Pierre Charbonnier, uh, whose work is really <laughs> compliment, <laughs> really uh, uh, sort of complementary to our point of view. Um, and I understand Pierre has just signed a contract to write the sequel to, to uh, Affluence and Freedom. So congratulations to Pierre. <laughs> yeah, so... I think we, we're going to wrap this up. We have enough uh, stimulating information to, to kind of uh, bounce around. And I think uh, I would not only your book was the necessary um, stimulation to actually have the discussion, but in any case, I would like to thank you both, uh, Frederick, Carl, for this uh, very nice conversation. I also want to thank all of you if you're still here and you're still watching and listening until the end. I know it's a it's a more of a theoretical and uh, history of ideas and history of uh, life. Well, how people were living back in the day, but I think you will find it very interesting and stimulating to think about our future life. Um, if you want to explore further topics, I, we mentioned uh, Jason Moore, for instance. We have an episode with him, Neil Brenner. Uh, we also had an episode together. So please feel free and uh, have a look at the recommendations that Carl and uh, Frederick gave you as well. Many thanks again, and we'll see you all in two weeks for another conversation.